Ladies and gentlemen, hello. 안녕하세요. 저 아브들 와비입니다. 오늘 이 행사의 좌장 맡은 역할입니다. 여러 귀한 걸음을 해주셔서 너무 감사합니다. 바쁜 와신 바쁜 와중에서도 이렇게 좀 재난 지역에서 활동하고 있는 분들 목소리 듣기 위해서 와주셔서 진심으로 감사합니다. 안토니오 코테로스 유엔 사무총장님 말로는 인도주의자들은 생명을 구하고 부호하다는 단 하나의 목적을 위해 재난 지역으로 더 깊이 문제의 최선적으로 더 가까이 나아, 나아가는 새로운 방법을 찾고 있다는 말씀하셨습니다. 문제 지역에서 재난 지역에서 앞서서 열심히 활동하고 있는 많은 분들 계십니다. 그분들 목소리를 듣기 위해서 오늘 이 섹션 마련했습니다. 전 세계 많은 지역에서 민족, 종교, 문화 다르면서 활동하고 있는 분들도 많습니다. 그분들 목소리를 오늘은 들으려고 합니다. 국경 없는 어, 이사들 오늘 이야기도 들어보고 그리고 시리아에서 오신 화이트 헬멧트 데뷔 목소리 오늘 들을 예정입니다. Thank you very much, Abdul Wahab, for the warm introduction. Um, today, we are reflecting on humanitarian responses in conflict zones, like we've seen in these videos. And assisting people affected by conflict has always been a focus of Médecins Sans Frontières operations. Indeed, in 2023, over 60% of MSF's interventions were in situations of armed conflict or internal instability. And in 2024, we are facing conflict-driven, large-scale humanitarian crises in multiple countries. MSF, Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, Guk Yang Omnen Lisa is an international independent medical humanitarian organization. And we were founded in 1971, then in the context of the Biafran War uh, in Paris by a group of journalists and doctors. Today, we are a movement of nearly 52,000 people working on over 500 projects in over 70 countries. And at this World Knowledge Forum, we've been asked how amid conflict, well, at the core of MSF's identity and MSF's activities is our commitment to independence, neutrality, and impartiality. We are independent. 98% of our income is raised from private donors. We rarely take funds from governments. We are neutral. In a conflict situation, we don't take sides. We go where people's medical needs are the greatest. And we are impartial. We will provide free medical care to people who need it. It doesn't matter where they're from, which religion they belong to, or what their political affiliations are. Our commitment to these principles and the impact of our organization that was built upon those principles was recognized in 1999 when MSF was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. The other core value to MSF is témoignage, or bearing witness. Bearing witness means speaking out about the suffering, the distress, the injustice, that we witness when carrying out our medical humanitarian work. And as medical humanitarian personnel, we are duty bound, not only to treat our patients, but to represent our patients when they are unable to represent themselves. For example, I am here to bear witness to the 10 million people who have been displaced because of the war in Sudan. And while this crisis may not grab headlines or trend on social media, it demands our attention and our action. I want to bear witness to the crisis in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where violence has escalated in the East, displacing record numbers of people. The displacement of more than five and a half million people has been compounded by disease outbreaks, including measles and cholera, and natural disasters, including floods and landslides. And now MPOX. 
And again, the international humanitarian response has been woefully inadequate. It's months too late, and we're still waiting for vaccines and other public health responses to ensure that those at risk receive the protection and care that they need in regards to the MPOX outbreak. But MSF is also working with local communities to respond to the many forgotten crises driven by conflict. The one million Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazaar, Asia's biggest refugee crisis. Large-scale mal malnutrition in northern Nigeria, ongoing suffering in Syria, Yemen, the Sahel, Myanmar, and Afghanistan. We're also present in the conflicts at the forefront of our minds, in Ukraine and in Gaza. And in Ukraine, we've seen repeated attacks on hospitals, including a recent attack on a children's hospital. And these have taken a tragic toll on lives and health infrastructure. In Gaza, where more than 40,000 Palestinians have been killed, the majority women and children, and where we are seeing another potential epidemic, an outbreak of polio, again, a disease that mostly impacts children. In Gaza, people are in desperate need of healthcare, but providing such services is becoming virtually impossible. Not even places of healthcare are safe from the bombs. According to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, hundreds of healthcare workers and aid workers have been killed since the beginning of the war including six of my MSF colleagues. In Gaza and indeed the West Bank, international humanitarian law principles are being repeatedly violated and humanitarian aid is systematically being impeded. And in Sudan, we are witnessing repeated attacks on healthcare facilities and the ongoing blockage of urgently needed medical supply trucks, which is putting even more lives at risk. Heavy restrictions by both warring parties have drastically limited capacities, including our own, to deliver aid. And so, while I have talked about how by holding tightly to our principles and working with local communities and bearing witness, MSF has been able to navigate conflict and complexity, but there are limited limits to humanitarianism. We can call for a ceasefire, but we cannot stop war. We cannot atta stop attacks on hospitals and patients. And we cannot open borders to allow aid in. We can fund our own activities through the generosity of our donors, but we cannot make up for the massive shortfall in aid that is required to respond to these crises. These are political responsibilities. And so we will continue to stress the collective responsibility of the UN Security Council and its members to protect and uphold the rules of war. The rules of war, international humanitarian law, underpins all the work that we do at MSF. And without it, we cannot safeguard the lives of our patients and staff. The ramifications of impunity with regards to international humanitarian law will echo across generations and across the world. And we have a collective responsibility to do all we can to stand on the side of humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much for the um, introduction. And um, it really touched me um, watching the video, um, the White Helmets. I have seen um, situations that really, really hit me, come back to me, because I have actually seen and worked in these contexts. So I have been in the field eight times, including twice in Syria. Uh, other conflict zones, such as uh, Yemen, Peshawar, Pakistan, uh, South Sudan, um, and also Nigeria. Um, all of them, due to my nature of being an emergency physician and an anesthesiologist, were in conflict zones. 
Also, most recently, I have been in Gaza. This was when the first, uh, I was in the first emergency response team after October 7th. And maybe perhaps because it is very relevant to the theme of this forum and very recent, uh, maybe I will talk more about my most recent uh, experience in Gaza. So what Emma has shared here is true. I know that it feels different when we just hear the numbers. And also, I know that when we hear from other world leaders that it seems like a far away thing that is going on. And from us in East Asia, it feels that it's happening in such a far away world uh, with such different people. I would say, being in the field, this is my eighth time, there are a lot of similarities to my prior experiences, and I will touch upon that in a little bit, but this experience was by far the worst situation. I was there almost a year ago when this first started. I had no idea that it would be lasting this long because of how extremely devastating the context was. We were the first team. It took two weeks for my team, four weeks for another team. We're both MSF, but just come from different operational centers to get into Gaza because we required approvals from parties, uh, three parties actually, Hamas, Egypt, and Israel. And that took a long time. It was frustrating. We all wanted to go in there as soon as possible. Last ditch effort on the last day of our visas, we were able to get in. We did not know what was there. We heard that there was not enough supplies. We heard the situation was a lot worse than it was. MSF has been working in Gaza for more than 30 years. We have been working for, with over 300 uh, locally hired staff. Since October 7th, our regular med medical activities had stopped and all our members, team members, locally hired MSF staff have been evacuating, uh, has not been able to work, and just in their rooms, uh, seeking safety, seeking food, whatnot. We were able to get in uh, November 14th, finally. We have been trying to get in since October. When we got in, I cannot remember the smiles on the face of our teammates who we've been working together. They said that we brought them hope. We didn't know where to stay. Uh, we didn't know how much equipment there was there. We knew that there was a warehouse next to the abandoned, not used clinic that we stayed in. Uh, we found out that MSF had managed to bring in equipment, not enough, but equipment uh, that filled a warehouse. And one of the jobs that us, the medical team, did was to figure out what equipments that we could bring in uh, to the hospital we worked at. So the coordinators figured out we should work at Nasser Hospital, which was still functional at that time. It is the biggest, it was at the biggest hospital in the middle of Gaza Strip in Han Yunis. At the time, there were airstrikes, the front lines were coming down from the north. So there were a lot of patients, citizens, um, medical staff who had evacuated from the north. There, I saw many mass casualties. I worked in the ER and the OR, the emergency room and the operating room. And I will say that these mass casualties, a lot of them and women who had nothing to do with this war, not guilty, anything, innocent, they were the ones who were most hurt. 
However, I saw the resilience and strength of people and the hope. They were very busy to just survive and hope for safety, <clears throat> hope for ceasefire. They were helping each other as a community that they didn't really, people who didn't know, but people who happened to be next to them at the hospital who, were, who was, that was full with patients on the ground, just evacuating medical staff also, since they lost their homes and many of them lost their families. They were just living in the hospital, in the corners of the hospital. They also had the same issues not enough food, not enough safety, having to worry about their families, but they still showed up to work and they still helped their patients. Again, just to repeat, we are so similar. We are so, the, the, the way patients interact with their children, the parents interact with their children, the way the children act, they lost their schools to bombing and they really wanted to show us what they learned in school. They would sing, they would uh, uh, say their phrases in English. Um, everything, everything was so similar to us. So, I don't know how to wrap this up, <laughs> but yes, um, being in the field, I really appreciate um, you know, the, the, the bandwidth um, with that we are so privileged here. And sometimes I struggle with a gap that why is there so much inequality in the world when we are so similar and we are the same fundamentally? So I'll stop there. Thank you. أولا حاب أشكر المنظمين المؤتمر على هاي الدعوة حقيقة حاب أشكر زملائي في MSF على الجهود العظيمة اللي قدموها أكيد للمتضررين بكل المناطق الحقيقة من من أكبر التحديات هو إدارة الكوارث في مناطق الصراع لا شك قبل شوي شفنا الفيديوهات اللي بتعرف عن الوايت هلمتس وأكيد صرتوا تعرفوا شو منشتغل قبل قبل 2011 أنا كنت أشتغل في التجارة بعد 2011 وبدأ وبدأ النظام يستخدم سلاح العقاب الجماعي ضد المدنيين كان ما عندنا خيارات الا يكون في مبادرات مجتمعيه لانقاذ المجتمع واحدى هاي المبادرات كانت الوايت هلمتس الخوذ البيضاء اللي هي فعليا بدات تشتغل في عمليات البحث والانقاذ خارج نطاق الدوله اللي ما بيكون في مكان في منطقه صراع ولا يوجد دوله اتطور عمل الخوذ البيضاء ل البرامج اللي نحن حكينا عنها قبل شوي بالفيديو والحقيقة أكبر تحدي واجه الخوذ البيضاء هو زلزال 6 شباط 2023 اللي ضرب جنوب تركيا وشمال سوريا الحقيقة هذا كان أصعب تحدي من مرفي كمؤسسي بهذا الوقت منطقة لا يوجد فيها دولة منطقة 14 سنة عم تعرض للصراع وقصف مستمر، البنية التحتية متهالكة، الأمم المتحدة ما عم بتقوم بدورها الصحيح. شو كان لازم تعمل منظمتنا؟ الحقيقة أول شيء عملته هي لبت النداء وبدأت تنتشر فرقنا، كان عندنا 3000 شخص في الميدان عم يشتغلوا على مدار الساعة. ب 72 ساعة ذهبية اللي بيذكروها بيقولوا عنا بالزلزال بعد الزلزال هي كنا عم نشتغل لوحدنا كنا عم نشتغل لوحدنا ولكن هون بيبرز دور المجتمع دور المجتمع كيف ممكن يوقف ويدعم عمليات الإغاثة لأنه عمليات الإغاثة بهي اللحظات هي عمليات مفصلية في حال غياب الدولي وغياب الأمم المتحدة وغياب المجتمع الدولي لكن المجتمع المحلي كان حاضر لذلك أنا من هذاك اليوم 
وفي كل مكان بقول لا يجب علينا أن ندعم المنظمات المحلية حتى تستطيع هي أن تقوم بدورها الحقيقي من غلال هي قدرتها على الوصول للمجتمع بشكل أسرع من خلال قدرتها على الوصول للاحتياجات بشكل أسرع من خلال قدرة على تجاوز العقبات البيروقراطية اللي ممكن يوضعوا أمامنا الدول والمنظ وال وال التي تتحكم بالإغاثة وتمنع وصولها للمحتاجين. نحن في 2000 بزلزال 2023 في 72 ساعة الأولى اللي ما قدرت تستجيب فيهم الأمم المتحدة درنا ننقذ 2175 شخص من تحت الانقاض شفتوا بعض الاطفال اللي طلعناهم من 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 بالفيديو قبل شوي وبنفس الوقت ولكن المنظمات المحليه تدفع ثمن نحن خلال عشر سنوات درنا ننقذ 128 الف انسان من تحت الانقاض اكيد هذا الرقم كثير كبير لكن ما هذا هو الانجاز العظيم اللي نحن بنعتقد انه نحن حققناه الانجاز اللي نحن بنعتقد بالوايت هيلمتس انه نحن حققناه انه نحن زرعنا الامل بشمال غرب سوريا وانه الناس بتنتظرنا لحتى ننقذها وهذا الشيء استنتجناه من خلال استطلاع راي عملناه ب 2015 سالنا الناس المدنيين مين بتتوقع ينقذك إذا حدا إذا انقصفت كان فقط 6% قالوا الوايت هيلمتس ب 2015 ب 2023 أجرينا نفس الاستطلاع كان في 93% جواب بيقول أنا بتوقع الوايت هيلمتس رح يجوا ينقذوني إذا صار قصف أو صار زلزال فهذا الشيء زراعة الأمل في هي المناطق هو من اهم الانجازات اللي بعتقد اللي نحن حققناها ولكن هاي الانجازات في دائما الى ثمن وبسبب هذا الثمن اللي بندفعه في مناطق الصراع المنظمات نحن فقدنا 310 من متطوعينا يعني تقريبا نحن فقدنا 10% من متطوعينا سقطوا اثناء تاديتهم لمهامهم الانسانيه وكانت من اصعب التحديات اللي واجهتنا واللي سقط فيها معظم متطوعينا هني الهجمات المزدوجه اللي كانت تنفذها روسيا ونظام السوري على المدنيين شو هي الهجمات المزدوجه الهجمات المزدوجه هي استراتيجيه عسكريه بيعتمدها النظام السوري وروسيا ضد المدنيين بقوم بيجي طيران حربي بينفذ غارة جوية في مكان هذا المكان بتستجيب له فرق الإسعاف والإنقاذ وتبلش تشتغل بعد عشر دقائق ترجع الطيارة مرة أخرى وبتنفذ غارة أخرى بس بتستهدف المنقذين والمدنيين اللي موجودين بهذا المكان هاي الاستراتيجية العسكرية خلتنا نخسر أكثر من 170 متطوع ومتطوعة كانوا عم يقدموا مهامهم الإنسانية هاي الضريبة اللي نحن عم 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 ندفعها دائما في مناطق الصراع هي ضريبة كثير كبيرة لذلك اليوم وقت نحن بنقول كيف نحن بندير الكوارث في مناطق الصراع نحن وقت بنعتمد على المجتمعات المحلية وقت هي لأنه هي تمتلك القدرة للوصول ولتقييم الاحتياجات بشكل حقيقي ولذلك أنا خلوني استغل هاي الفرصة وأشكر زملائنا وأصدقائنا بـ MSF بكل العالم ليس فقط بس باليابان وبكوريا وإنما MSF فرنسا و MSF, MSF بلجيم و MSF بكل مكان بالعالم لأنه فعليا هن مؤسسة بنيت على القيم والمبادئ والحيادية مثل ما نحن أسسنا مؤسسنا على الحيادية لتقدم خدماتها بدون تمييز لا بالعرق ولا باللون ولا بالدين شكرا جزيلا لكم جميعا
사실 시간 관계상으로는 더 다른 이야기를 들을 수 없는데요 형장 이야기는 듣자고 하면 사실은 밤새 해야 3, 4일 연속으로는 이야기해도 끝나진 않습니다 국경 없는 인사회에 하시는 활동 화이트헬멧 하는 활동 헬프스리아 다른 멋진 단체들도 많습니다 그분들 형장에서는 하루하루 피 흘리면서 땀 흘리면서 활동하고 있는데 희망이라는 단어를 다 첨부해주면서 활동하고 있습니다 우리는 이 자리에서든 해줄 수 있는 것 공감하고 연대하고 같이 응원해주면 좋겠습니다 우리 함께 손을 잡고 문제 지역에 있는 사람들 목소리 들으면서 해, 우리 제자리에서 해줄 수 있는 역할을 하면 그것은 바로 궁증, 그 익시스텐스를 해줄 수 있는 것 아닌가 싶습니다. 저는 이 자리에서는 그 익시스텐스에 대해서는 뭐라고 말하면 이 자리에서 우리가 같은 섹션에서는 이런 이야기를 또 듣고 공유하면서 공간만 아니라 실천했으면 좋겠습니다. 제 자리에서 실천할 수 있는 부분이 있다면 그거는 바로 그 익시스텐스라고 생각은 합니다. 긴 시간은 아니었지만 귀한 시간, 귀한 말씀을 해주시는 분들께서 진심으로 감사드립니다. 이마 캠블 씨, thank you, thank you so much, and also 요코나 카지마 씨, 진심으로 감사드립니다. 세이드라 더 살레. 시크란 제지란 감사합니다. 네, 저, 저, 여러분도 감사합니다. 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 감사합니다.